Good morning, those of you here Good in morning. Hawaii. Good afternoon or evening, those of you elsewhere. Thanks so much for joining us on Think Tech Hawaii. And we have another all-star group. We have Professor Vanilla Randall, Emeritus from University of Dayton School of Law, one of, if not the leading expert on race, racism and the law with literally thousands of subscribers to her compendium of articles and blogs and information on that. And this year's winner of the Great Teacher Award from the Society of American Law Teachers. And that's a recognition of a real teacher's teacher from the people who do law teaching as a living. So just want to acknowledge that that's especially meaningful. Ben Davis, former chair of the American Bar Association Dispute Resolution Section, the winner of the Ellenberg Raven Award and others, international scholar in Europe and in the US, and now teaching at Washington and Lee School of Law, and David Larson, chair of the ABA DR section, and the pioneer of New York's online court case resolution program, which is now going strong after five, six years of foundational work that David led and has made very effective. So thank you all for joining us. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot going on. If we were going to pick one issue that's of greatest concern to you right now, where something constructive needs to happen urgently, Professor Randall, what would be your pick? Well, I always, my pick is that as long as we don't have, uh, as long as we legally allow racial discrimination, that's my pick eliminating, uh, passing laws that would eliminate all forms of racial discrimination. And as long as that doesn't happen, you know, there be hot pockets of stuff that comes up. But the fact is, 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 is that we illegally allow people to discriminate and that discrimination is uh, uh, pervasive. So that would be something that could be done Maybe not after the midterms, but. <laughs> David, what's number one on your list? Well, our law school here in St. Paul, the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, recently adopted a statement that we're going to be an anti racist law school. And we're trying to make a lot of changes that um, implement that mission statement. So that's certainly very important. And it's gonna be important for our institution moving forward. Um, when we think about urgency and immediacy, um, of course, I'm thinking about Ukraine every day and what's happening over there and um, the possibility of that conflict getting larger and more destructive uh, and continuing to be destructive even within the borders of Ukraine. So that's, that's troubling to me and something I feel needs to be addressed ASAP. And then locally, uh, we've got a big teacher strike here in Minneapolis, and there's a lot of public school kids that are not sure where they're going and what they're doing, and their parents suddenly have them thrown back at them after the pandemic and trying to teach at home. So there's a lot of chaos in the Twin Cities right now um, with the big teacher strike. Well connected. Brother Ben, what's on your mind? Um, kind of tied to a couple different things that you all have already said, uh, Professor Randall and, and, and David. Um, one is, uh, we've really got a problem in our Supreme Court uh, that uh, really bothers me. There was a decision just came down like on March 3rd about this guy named Abu Zubaydah who was tortured. And everybody recognized he was tortured. I mean, it's not even an issue. And uh, the Polish authorities are 
opening a criminal investigation, right? About who was doing it and all that. And he, uh, you know, the, the idea is he's supposed to be able to testify. And there's a Supreme Court case saying where in Poland cannot be revealed where he was tortured. Poland's already been condemned by the European Court of Human Rights. Poland has a mutual legal assistance treaty with the United States, and they did the proper channel thing of asking the United States, can you provide this, that, and the other information? The United States said, national security. Boom, shut that down. So he testified, and, and it, it's complicating the Polish criminal process that they can't get this evidence. Now, everyone in the world knows where the guy was. There's a town called Stary Kieczkuti in Poland, all right? I mean, it's, it's well known. But the thing is, is for having the CIA say he was tortured at Stary Kijkuti is a, is a state secret. And one of the things that really struck me in that decision, which was a fractured decision, is you had Justice Gorsuch and Justice Sotomayor together dissenting on the nonsense. You know, it's like, come on, man. Uh, the state secrets thing was already started out as uh, on the basis of basically trying to hide negligence by the army with regards to the death of somebody's uh, uh, um, relative back in the 50s. And you can't even say where the actual, every, where everyone knows it, it happened, you know what I mean? And then he's got to testify and he's got to get authorized to testify. And then it's like, well, yeah, he, he can go ahead and testify subject to what the CIA tells him he can say, which means that, you know, they're going to muzzle him too, right? You know, and you just read this decision by, by the way, Justice Breyer, okay, just to let you know, with the other guys who are the conservatives. And you're like, seriously, are we really at this point of hiding stuff that you can't even mention the actual place where the guy was tortured? Because, you know, you got to build the evidence about what exactly happened to him and all that stuff. And keeping all that secret, it, it, it's appalling. It's appalling to me, okay? I mean, I'm just like, I, I read that and I was just mortified that our government is that messed up, you know, in the positions it was taking. By the way, this is a Republican or Democratic administration, doesn't matter. The state secrets line is so strong and it, it, it gets to a point where it's kind of like almost uh, Kafkaesque. State secret security national security in the name of the national security, uh, you know, all kinds of sins are not sins un under the law. And that's how we ended up putting, excuse me, Japanese Americans into concentration camps. Uh, so, you know, I mean, when you come back and this guy was, uh, uh, released who had been in jail for killing Malcolm X. And it turns out that the FBI held back evidence to both the defense and the prosecution. You know, I mean, that would have solved, you know, would have probably exonerated the guy. I was like, that's really deep that it's this, the wall is such that neither the prosecutor or the defense gets this whole series of relevant information that would have maybe changed that case back in the day. You know what I mean? It's a, you look at these things and you say it's it's uh, it's it's kind of uh, to me at least it's very very troubling and uh, oh, I, I I think it's really wrong and I actually agreed with Justice Gorsuch and Justice uh, uh, Sotomayor who were basically saying you know state secrets is not about hiding things that you did wrong you know it's about other stuff than that and uh, and we can't just throw things under that bus so to speak so no one ever gets accountability for what they do, you know. You know, it's that's the, just me. What's kind of depressing is it's a, you know, it's a constant vigil. Um, you know, it, it just resurfaces all the time. It's an effort to kind of control status quo, control power. Um, you know, you're seeing all kinds of variations of this happening in every conceivable realm where people continue to do things um, behind closed doors. Um, kind of surreptitiously trying to slide things through in an effort to, to control. Yeah, and it's. Um, I don't you know, know what 
I don't know how we move the Supreme Court. I mean, I think the Supreme Court is corrupt. Uh, the, that the the Republicans on it do things that would they couldn't that if they were lower judges lower level judges would get some of the Republicans not all do things on it that if they were lower level judges would get them impeached and they keep refusing to uh, apply a code of ethical conduct to the Supreme Court sort of like we 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 can take care of ourselves. Uh, I am also concerned. I hate this way we talk about the Supreme Court being conservative and liberal. It's right and middle mm. with <laughs> you know, with some justice being left on some issues, but that they they're philosoph they're not they're not philosophically to the left judicially they're just on some issues which brings me to the issue of brown i'm really concerned about her i think you know i i i it's a you know it's, we're celebrating uh, getting a black woman on the judicial court and she's more qualified on the standard stuff than than anybody who's been brought up in the last few times. So it's not about qualification. But she also has some she also has the point the support of the fraternal frater, uh, fraternal uh officers office of police. Is that right? Did I say the it right? Fr fraternal order, yeah. The fraternal order of police. And I read her things and basically and I think you're right about this. She has issued things that sort of protect the qualified immunity. And if for if for black and brown people, Native American people, although Native Americans who are on on reservations are not subject if to the crimes, not subject to the same sort of qualified immunity on their reservation. But if black and brown people are being killed by police and we can't get police into court because of qualified immunity, I don't know that it does us any good to have her at the table because that's what everybody said. We need to have, we have, we need a black woman at the table. Do we need a black neoliberal law enforcement protecting woman at the table personally? I kind of rather just have a white man be there so that when I complain, I can say, hey, this is about white men, not about black people. And her, her being on the court, if she continues down the road, she's been going down on qualified immunity will give cover to white supremacist racists who say that it's not racist because they'll point to her and say, ah, uh -huh, look, this black woman who the liberals support says qualified immunity is a good idea. So I, I have a, that concern about her being on the Supreme Court. A couple of questions. Um, one from what was raised a few minutes earlier. Should we have term limits on the Supreme Court? Is that a, is that a solution? Um, number one, and should we be supporting this candidate for the Supreme Court? Um, I'm suggesting getting this suggestion from Professor Randall. Randall, not she's not sure. There was a point when we could may have gotten someone uh, different, but none of the candidates that Biden put forth was better than her. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so all of my criticisms of her, of her, none of the black candidates were black women candidates were better than her. He found, he picked, he didn't go with what's her name with the Cheryl you know, Eiffel. Cheryl Eiffel. She would have been, she, but she was, you know, she didn't have. So he picked a concern, a moderate black jurist. And I think we just need to say that over and over again so that people don't get the idea that she's going to do stuff that she might. I mean, she could, 
I mean, Earl Warren did stuff different, so she okay. could get on and say, be different. Um, well, what was your other question? I was just going to agree with you, just if I could, to just say that, you know, Thurgood Marshall or Constance Baker Motley would never be able to get on the courts today. You think about it. I mean, I, I don't see any way that in the way essentially moderate, uh, the Democrats propose moderate candidates and Republicans propose basically to the right yeah. and they they just wouldn't have got got you know they, they, not onto any court let alone on the supreme court uh, I, I, that's that's the, the this unfortunate set of affairs uh oh is that is that is that answer term limits the kind of that's the question i think professor randall wanted to get back to um, I, yeah. I think term limits are important just because i think uh, the, that that nobody should have that kind of power indefinitely. And just because you can live to 90 don't mean you should be on the Supreme Court for 50 years. Uh, but on the other hand, I just, I want some other method that goes beyond Democrats and Republicans appointing their viewpoint to the Supreme Court with and closing out all of us that are not Democrats, Republican, and not leaning, because people say independents are either Democrats leaning or Republicans leaning. Some of us don't lean either the way. Some of us are to the far left, and we ain't leaning Democrat or far right. right. And I right. think that the, the court needs to represent a wider view of political philosophy. I don't know how you do that with the way we currently appoint people and structure it. But if we're going to do term limits, maybe we could also include that there has to be representation of socialist views, uh, at least, you know, on the quarters, yeah. something like that. What, I use socialist about, as an example. Okay, what is an as an alternative if it was a mandatory retirement age, like 70? So it's not a term limit, but once you hit 70, I mean, I always liked the fact that, what was it, Justice Souter, he hit 65 and said, I'm out of here, see you later. You know, they sort of like normal retiring people kind of do, you know, but what about that? They're just, you know, at 70, you have to retire. Now, even if you're, you know. That might be a good alternative. I, you know, and Maybe I'm thinking about this too much about my own aging process. And I, I sort of feel like that what we what we see a lot going on in Congress and in the Supreme Court is changing the processes to deal with aging people. Mm. Uh, so that and you know, and it's easier for the the Supreme Court to cover because they don't have to come out and walk and talk in front of the thing. But you just look at how infrequent the Congress people actually stand up and talk, how they don't come out very much. Uh, and you know, I was telling my son, and maybe I'm just imagining things, you never see them walking anywhere. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they're no, always or, there, you know. Or, or yeah, like the, the old style yeah. filibuster. You remember that they had to stand up and talk to do it, and then they set it up to think. All you have to do is, you know, send in. Hey, I'm doing a filibuster, and then you know you don't have to do anything. You know. Then yes, yeah, the question about mandatory retirement is interesting. When you think about the age of our president, the age of our former president, the age of Nancy Pelosi, the yeah. age of Mitch McConnell, um, you know, we're all. I mean, the highest, most powerful people are octogenarians, um, or just yeah. about. Um, so. Uh, I'm not sure how that plays in the mandatory retirement. No, absolutely. Maybe I, well, the mandatory retirement goes all the way up. You could run for president, but when you hit 70, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I just remember when I went to the World Conference Against Racism and they put 30 year olds in the youth group. Now I wasn't, I was older, I was in my 50s at the time, but I was talking to some 30 year old and they said, the problem is, is, is none of these people are getting out of the way. 
So there's there's no upward mobility because nobody's leaving. They're getting, they got long lives, they get in those positions, they stay. And so you're not promoting the 50 year olds, you're not promoting the 40 years old. And so a, a, 30, a 28 to 29 year old stays stuck in what is essentially, uh, you know, he's a, they're an adult, but they can't get the experience because nobody is moving out the way. You know, everybody wants to keep working until they drop over. So they want to keep the power. Maybe if we give them some kind of alternative power. Yeah. You know, what about the, the elders kind of thing? You know, we're there would be sort of a council of elders, you know? Yes. I mean, they, we, we had that de facto, you know, with the, the famous old quote unquote wise men that would be councils to a president. Like I'm trying to think of some of those names along the way, but there was sort of like a kitchen cabinet, a hidden cabinet, you know, but it would be just, you know, uh, kind of a council of elders with at, uh, at most advisory, you know, they, they gave advice. They gave advice. They're, they're, nothing binds anybody. You know, we don't have a court that can give advisory opinions like the, so the uh, Supreme Court of Canada does. So we'd have a council of elders that would provide sort of what they see at 80, you know, kind of remember, I don't know. I don't know who's going to, who's going to name them, all that stuff. I don't know. But I, I, I want to add something else that I think is relevant to the Supreme Court because uh, Professor Melissa Murray came to speak at the law school met, um, I think yesterday, you know, and she's got an article that just came out in Harvard Law Review where she's analyzing the, uh, the abortion likelihood cases. And she mentions it, I think it's a 2019 concurrence by, the, uh, by Justice Thomas who is basically going at, at the anti-abortion thing from a point of view of basically being anti-eugenics, you know, the whole Margaret Sanger, I started yeah. Planned Parenting, and uh, going at it from point of view of uh, it's, it's anti-abortion uh, is anti-Black based on that history. And, and so apparently in that opinion, he does a, a version of history that Professor Murray in her article, Harvard Law Review, amps up much more and shows, in fact, there are lots more nuances and the visions in the Black community with regards to abortion, from family planning visions to visions that did think of it, it was like genocide, you know, and she just did this really rich thing. And um, I, I, in terms of what we're waiting for that decision of, you know, if the Thomas sort of uh, re, uh, revisionist history is used as a base to attack Ro not only Roe, but Griswold and contraception. Uh, it's a really, it, it, she made a very provoke, a very, at least thought provoking concern about the tack that might be taken by the majority in its decision coming out. And uh, so I, I think that's something that we should, we should worry about the sort of uh, revisionist history uh, of the, the of um, basically the black, black movement that is kind of used as a wedge uh, to attack both abortion and contraception under Griswold and the right of privacy. And I wonder, I think that's, yeah, excellent point. And I wonder if they will use this as an opportunity to uh, turn back Brown versus Board of Education. Well, that, that's where I worry about the religious kind of the, the push of the religious side of things, you know, the, the, you know, your deep held beliefs, because one of the things with the court generally is that you never question anybody's religious belief. It's like they deal with it in the context of not questioning the person's belief. Right. And that, you know, obviously there are different religious beliefs that have happened along the way that have basically been about subordination of this, that or the other person because they're not true Christians or not my kind of Christian and all that, you know, here in Virginia, for example, they didn't have quote unquote official religion, but if you wanted to be a Baptist, you know, you had to get a license to preach and oh, you couldn't get a license, but you're free to be a Baptist, but you just, you know, that's the kind of the old colonial thing. But well, um, that, the, that I, idea I like of not, that. the idea of not questioning religious beliefs, um, when we're thinking about in different contexts, you know, Florida had the, um, 
had uh, kind of took an anti-mask, anti-vaccine position. And um, you wouldn't have to take vaccines or masks if you had a sincere religious belief. And so what they did in Florida was they have, and it's available on the website, you can download a form, a, relig a, a religious belief form that basically <laughs> you just check it off. You just say, yes, I have a sincere religious belief. At the yeah. bottom of the form is bold face print that says, no one is entitled to question the above um, confession of sincere belief. Um, right. And you will be bound by it. So yeah. that's, that's the depth of the, um, the necessary and, sincere belief as a checkbox on an internet form. And, I, and the thing, the problem becomes is racism has been centered in religion. Racial right. discrimination was centered in religion. It was, uh, and and while mo many religions have moved away from the doctrine, racial doctrine, many have not. And so, if the Supreme Court promotes severe, I mean, serious, uh, what was it? Serious, sincere. Sorry, sincere religious belief as the standard by which uh, you, your behavior preempts other rights, constitutional rights. I don't understand how they will, how will they be able to articulate that a First Amendment, so sincere religious belief is preempted by a 14th Amendment right to equal protection thank you exactly the battle right the battle lines are drawn right there absolutely you know and how and how they're going to do that dance between the first and the 13th 14th and 15th i think it's early 14th exactly. you know exactly you know how they're going to do that I, it'll be uh, and i, I, I don't think, think they uh, will no. i think they'll i think they will go to first amendment and it's up to the states to decide how that's enacted in each state so right. that you can have state rights. Or, you know, like women's subordination, for example, in, in religious yes. traditions. Um, um, I was listening, uh, just to get back to Ukraine a little, I was actually listening to uh, 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 some comments by the head of the Russian Orthodox Church in uh, Russia, you know, which was basically veiled criticism of lgbtq as being you know sort of against god's will right you know like that and so that can imagine you know that kind of religious faith being done to and in fact there's some case that's coming up where the person is positioned as something along the lines of i'm opening a business and because of my beliefs i am not going to deal with lgbtq people hasn't sold the thing hasn't met a person but they this case has been taken to see whether a person can do that well if somebody can do that, obviously I can go and say, I'm opening a business and I don't want any black people or I don't want people with disabilities because that's my faith or whatever, you know what I mean? And if that's enrined, but you don't, you have no anti-discrimination law. Hey, going, to that, going to that concern about the first amendment, you know, the, the standard line has been that if we look more closely at the decisions being made, we are interfering with the administration, to the understanding, to the philosophy of that religion. And um, you, know, you see it in Title VII cases when uh, a court is reluctant to try and make a comparison between parties by saying that if we have to actually dive into the specifics as to the comparable status of these individuals to make our similarly situated analysis, we're going too far. Um, yes. you know, so only if only if they are uh, ostensibly indisputably um, similarly situated on their face, um, we're not going to get involved because that's that's imposing on the First Amendment. And when you start reading it that broadly, then then you are starting to eviscerate those 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 rights. Yeah, and much as I hate to say it, we are out of time for today. <laughs> We've got a lot of momentum going. Please come back and rejoin us in a couple of weeks. We've got a lot of things out there, broken systems, broken rules, like the old Bob Dylan song, everything broken. Yes. Where are the fixes? Thanks Thank so, you much. so much. Think Tech Hawaii, Thank you. Professor Randall. Thank you. Ben, David, 
and all of you who are joining us, thanks so much.